Hey, I'm back. Nice to see you all again. Or at least it's nice for you all to see me again. Uh, hopefully the first two uh, lectures that we did, the little videos, uh, went well and, and they help with you understanding some of the notes that I had to write down and some of the things you read in your book. Uh, and to be honest, uh, between me making this and you seeing it, I should get some feedback from you guys on Schoology as well. So by the time you see this, I will have gotten some feedback. Uh, and hopefully it's positive and it's, it's, it's worthwhile. Uh, as I said before, just trying to do a couple different topics this way, just to be a little bit more engaging, to give you a little bit more uh, explanation for Mr. Watt. The, uh, to review the last video that I posted, we went over weapons and technology. We talked about the rifles. Hopefully, you, uh, as per your instructions on Schoology, hopefully you also watched the short video that I posted on the mini ball and the rifling. It probably does an even better job explaining it than I did the other day, but uh, you put the two together and hopefully you have a good sense of, of what that rifling technology was all about and how it affected the war. Okay, so that leads us to uh, the next uh, topic that I want to cover today, and that is uh, some, some broad stuff about the Union and Confederate strategies as this war was unfolding, but also one very specific battle that we'll cover as well today. This one hopefully should go a little bit faster. So in your notes, I skipped through some things already that uh, about the Battle of Shiloh and the blockade. You should be reading about that and you took the notes on it. We're now at the slide that says tactics and strategy. So uh, while you're watching this or pause me or whatever, get out your notes and let's move to this uh, page where it says tactics and strategy. It's the page that has the uh, picture of the, the map of the United States on it, which we'll get to in a second. Okay, so I'm going to start with the Union strategy. At the beginning of the war, the Union had three things that it wanted to do. It had a three-part strategy. The first thing that the Union wanted to do was ultimately to capture the Confederate capital of Richmond, but they tried that at first Manassas by marching southward. It didn't work. And so their new strategy to try to attack and capture Richmond was to use their naval forces and sail down the Atlantic coast and attack Richmond from what would be the east, land their soldiers uh, on the Atlantic coast, and then march eastward. The second strategy that they wanted to do was to blockade the south. You read about that, you took some notes on it. Ultimately, the Union blockade uh, involved them uh, posting their naval forces all along the coastline of the southern states and not allowing anything to go in or out of Confederate states through their seaports. And they, that way, they hoped that they could keep them from exporting cotton, and they could keep them from importing any weapons and materials that they would need. And then the third thing was to go out west and try to take over control of the Mississippi River, which was a, a major thoroughfare for the Confederates to move cotton and supplies and soldiers and slaves and whatever up and down the Mississippi River. So if we look at a map here, let's see if my board can only work. So if we look at the board this way, we already know at the beginning of the war, the Union controls all of this. This is just Northern Territory up here. Let's try to read like this. So this is all Union control. The first, uh, or the second thing that I've listed there is that they wanted to also blockade the South. So they were going to take their naval forces and surround the coastline of the South. Not let anything get in or out. Then the third thing, was to take control of the Mississippi River. If the Union is able to do all three of those things, ultimately they have what? Surrounded the main part of the Confederate States. If and when they can do all three of those things, the Union plans to start squeezing the Confederacy all the way to Richmond until they can take them out. And because of that, this gets the name the Anaconda Plan. Like a snake wrapping around its victim and squeezing it into submission. And that's what the Union wanted to do. The Confederacy, much easier strategy, much simpler. What do you think it is? Well, you wrote it down. The Confederate strategy is quite simply to defend themselves, to defend their own soil. Think about it this way. In order for the Union to win, they have to physically go into the Confederacy 
grab them by their collar, shake them and say, you're coming back with us. You're not allowed to leave. They have to do that to win. Is that what the Confederates have to do? Do they even want to march up into the north and grab those northerners and say, you're coming with us? No. They just want to be separate from the north. So all they have to do is keep the northern Union armies from invading them. And if they do that, they would win. So whose strategy do you think was, or whose um, uh, end goal do you think was easier to accomplish? The Unions or the Confederates? Confederates had a much easier task. But uh, there you go. That's the, the strategy of both sides at the beginning of the war. Okay, so I'm going to uh, introduce you to one guy. Before I go into the one battle that I want to cover in this little video. And that man is the uh, general that was placed in charge of the Union armies at the beginning of the war. And his name is George B. McClellan. When the war began, there was an old timer who was the highest ranking officer in the Union Army, who was a hero, sort of, from the Mexican War. You should remember him, Winfield Scott. But by this time, when the Civil War began, he was an old timer. And shortly after the war begins, he retires. And so that's when a young, uh, uh, seemingly good man for the job, General George B. McClellan, is placed in charge of the Union Army. Two things I want you to know about. Number one, George McClellan was very well known for training, for preparing, for drilling, for making sure that his men were the most well-trained force they could be, making sure they had all the supplies necessary so that when they went into battle against an enemy, they had the greatest possibility of being successful and winning. Seems like a very positive uh, uh, personality trait for a general. A second trait that we also know about him was that he also was known for hesitating, uh, not acting when he should, and being too hesitant. A lot of that had to do with the fact that he oftentimes wasn't convinced that his men had enough training. Before they went into battle, he would wait and make sure they got more training. He was, wasn't sure if they had enough supplies. He wasn't going to send them into battle until he knew they had enough supplies. And so because of that, sometimes he missed opportunities to attack his enemies. Keep that in mind as we go over this battle right now. There's a lot of stuff here in your notes that I'm skipping that you will be reading about and that you will be watching some videos and doing some assignments on. You already have been. Uh, so I'm jumping right to what's called the Peninsula Campaign. Like I did with Manassas, I'm going to hit just a few of the most significant things. In fact, I'm going to draw some things over here as well. Let me put all these up here. I'm going to come over here. Black. <clears throat> We're going to go through these notes. I'm going to explain the major, most important things about the battle. I'm going to draw some things over here that hopefully make sense. Uh, if the drawing is helpful, by all means, draw it in your notes. If it's confusing and it's not helpful, just listen and watch. You don't have to worry about the drawing. But, uh, there we have a picture of uh, George B. McClellan, the guy that liked to, uh, liked to prepare his men, but also hesitate in, in battle. Uh, and it is uh, McClellan that is given the task of uh, sailing south and attacking Richmond from the east. It becomes known as the Peninsula Campaign. So what happens is this. So we have the Atlantic coast here, and that would mean that this is the Atlantic Ocean out here. Uh, Washington, D.C. would be up here. Can they see that, T? Yep. All right. And south of that, just inland from the Atlantic Ocean, was the capital, Richmond. Flowing from Richmond to the Atlantic Ocean were two rivers, the York River and the James River. Between those two rivers is a body of land. Well, a body of land between two bodies of water is called a peninsula. That was going to be where George McClellan wanted to make his attack on Richmond. So what he does is he takes his naval forces and the Union sails south down the Atlantic coast. They want to land ground troops on the coast, on this peninsula, and march eastward towards Richmond. The problem is there was a heavily fortified fort and town guarding the peninsula 
called Yorktown. And in our notes it says that McClellan finally took Yorktown. And then he slowly moved up the peninsula between the York and the James Rivers. Why do I bold that in our notes? Because I'm implying that this was that personality trait that cost McClellan in different times. Most people look back on it now, and even at the time, President Lincoln and other commanders said he should have been able to wipe out Yorktown quickly and easily and then land Union forces on the peninsula. But he hesitated and he took too long. All right, well, eventually he does defeat Yorktown and he is able to land forces uh, on the uh, coast. But then it says that he slowly moves his Union forces up the peninsula towards Richmond. Many people believe that he should have been able to make that advance a lot faster. What do you think the Confederates are doing at Richmond while General McClellan is finally taking Yorktown and slowly moving up the peninsula? You know what they're doing. They are digging in and fortifying the city of Richmond from attack. Now, as it gets, uh, as the Union moves further up the peninsula and they are eventually ready to start their attack on the city of Richmond, General Robert E. Lee, it's the first time mentioning him, you read about him in your book and you've heard about him before, he's the commander of the Confederate armies. Robert E. Lee makes an interesting move. It says that Confederate General Robert E. Lee uh, sent Stonewall Jackson north towards D.C., you remember Stonewall Jackson, he's the man. Everybody knows it, and Lee gives him an order to leave Richmond and start heading northward towards Washington, D.C. He makes, General Lee makes sure that General McClellan and everybody in the Union knows that he sent Jackson north towards Washington, D.C. Because as soon as McClellan and the Union find out that the great Stonewall Jackson is heading north towards Washington, D.C., what do they gotta do? They have to protect it. That forces some of the Union forces to back off the peninsula, get back in their naval ships, and head north to protect Washington, D.C. from Stonewall Jackson's attack. Guess what Stonewall Jackson does as soon as that happens? He simply turns right around and comes right back to Richmond to help dig in and fortify the city. He had no intentions of ever attacking Washington. It was all a ploy to try to force some of the Union soldiers away from Richmond. Now, with a smaller force than he had before, McClellan is going to try to attack Richmond. Lee has Stonewall Jackson now reinforcing him and digging in to protect the city, and the, the battle is on. All I'm going to tell you about this is two things. Well, it'll end up being three, because I'll give you a strange and fascinating fact. But two things I want you to know about this final battle at Richmond. Number one, the name of it. It is called the Seven Days Battle. It is because, you guessed it, they fought for seven days. And in those seven days, McClellan tried to attack Richmond from the south. And Lee moved forces and stopped it. McClellan, on another day, would try to attack over here. Lee would outmaneuver him, move his forces, and stop him. And this went on for seven days. Battle after battle. They're all different names. There's the Battle of Gaines Mill, the Battle of Seven Pines, the Battle of Fair Oaks. There's seven of them. What I want you to know, as it says in our notes, is that General Lee simply outmaneuvered McClellan during the Seven Days Battle. And after seven days of trying to capture Richmond, unsuccessfully, George McClellan and the Union forces had to evacuate back down the peninsula, get back in their ships, and go back to uh, the drawing board up north. And so it's yet another uh, example of a great Confederate victory against uh, the Union forces. Okay, as I said, I kind of got draw, I got scribbles all over the place now, and if that was confusing to you, don't draw that. But for some of you, that may have been helpful just to see it, and even though I'm scribbling all over the place, and if it is helpful, draw it in your notes by all means. I'm going to end the uh, description or the explanation of this, uh, the Peninsula Campaign or the Seven Days Battle. Those, kind of, those two names kind of go together. The Peninsula Campaign, that's the months of planning and sailing and then landing. 
The seven days battle is the final week of fighting in and around Richmond. But I'm going to end the explanation and description of the seven days battle with your strange and fascinating fact for today. And that is the last bullet point here. Someone we all know that is near and dear to us fought in this battle because, see in there? Hey guys. <laughs> General, well at the time, Colonel John McLean served for the Union Army as he led a regiment from Erie County called the 83rd Pennsylvania. It was a bunch of Erie County soldiers that, went, that, that, that volunteered or, yeah, at this point volunteered to go serve with uh, John McLean. They served at the Seven Days Battle, and that is where General John McLean was killed in action. That's what KIA stands for. He was killed at one of the Seven Days Battle called Gaines Mill. Now, I'm just going to give you one uh, other tidbit about this strange and fascinating fact and the fact that our school is named after this guy. And I'll give you another one later as we continue uh, studying the war. The, uh, the one thing I will tell you is this, that when he was killed at Gaines Mill, uh, he, was fought, he was killed fighting on the battlefield. His family, he was a, came from a wealthy family in Erie County, they requested that his body be brought back to Erie and that he be buried in the family cemetery. And Well, it's not the family cemetery, in the plot that the family had in Erie Cemetery, which is up on Cherry Street by St. Vincent Hospital. And you can go and visit both John McLean and his wife because they're buried there and their headstones are there. One of the first things I did whenever I got this job and I moved here and I had no idea who John McLean was, was I went and visited him uh, up there in the cemetery. And I've visited him a couple times since. Every once in a while, I'll stop in to see him. So if you're bored and you want to get out of the house, as long as you keep your distance from anybody else, although cemeteries are probably good places to go, there's not too many people there, you could go and visit John McClain. All right, and there you have the Peninsula Campaign. I will see you all in Schoology. <laughs>